when I was first in opposition, I had the portfolio of corrective services. And I can tell you, I've been into every prison in the state at least twice. And you go into those places and you see how the population continues to grow in our prison population. You know that uh, in this state, 40% of the adult male prison population is Aboriginal. That's extraordinary. It's more than, way more than double any other state in the country. It's not because we have massively uh, bigger numbers. You'll hear the argument that's because we have a bigger proportion of our population who are Aboriginal. The state's population, uh, Aboriginal-wise, is about, you know, it's about 3.2% Aboriginal. It's not 40%. In some of the other states um, and territories, or in Northern Territory, it's much higher. They have a higher percentage of Indigenous people in their prison population but they're a much smaller uh, overall population and Indigenous people are a much greater percentage of, the, of their, their people. So there is no real justification. and We shouldn't accept that we have this huge number of people in our prison system who are Aboriginal. But what's more concerning about that is when you go there, you learn that uh, in the juvenile detention centres, the prison population can be as high as 85 to 90%. So the next generation coming along is predominantly Aboriginal as well, of, of juvenile offenders. And you know that once they get in the adult system, an Aboriginal person reoffends at the rate of 70% within two years of release. So it's a significant problem for Western Australia. What's this got to do with education? Well, if you do a little bit of research, and, and you may have heard that in Scotland they did. We don't do it in Western Australia. We don't go into our prisons and say, what is the uh, literacy rate of our prisoners? We don't spend any time on anything like that. But in Scotland they did a study and they, they determined that in some prisons the uh, functional illiteracy rate of prisoners was as high as 70%. And, there's, and you would know anyway, I think there's, there's any number of studies. Um, we had Ben Levin over here at the Primary Principals Association earlier this year. He did a study uh, in the, uh, I think around 2005, that showed in the States that for uh, black men, if you can get them to go to, or black Americans, uh, African Americans, if you can get them to stay at school until the end of high school, there was a direct return to the state of in the order of $279,000 each individual in the way of um, savings made on crime made on health, made on contributions to the community. They did a, an analysis of it, but there's a lot of studies that, that prove that uh, education, and that was just staying at school, that wasn't achieving anything necessarily. That wasn't even beyond um, being there for that period of time. So there's a lot of opportunities to change where we're at. I think the only opportunity to change where we're at uh, with regard to our prison system and the consequences that you will all suffer. If um, we don't change that, then all of us will suffer a growing, ISA, um, detached group of predominantly young black males who will see themselves as got, having nothing in common with society. And if we don't try and tackle that, we'll all suffer. Now, I see the education system as a key part of it. It's, you won't have the full responsibility, but we, can, we play a key part because education is generally where you'll first identify these, these people. And then it'll be the... Uh, place where we can bring other resources to bear to try and tackle what's causing the problem in the community. So those are the things that are motivating me, uh, why I see education as such a vital role and why I'm very happy to have this portfolio. Firstly, because I'm part of it, I have children in it, and I can see how vital it is for changing our society for the better in the near term, and it's not some abstract thing this problem with uh, our Indigenous kids being excluded is going on right now and it's getting worse and if we don't tackle it, there will really be some serious issues in, this, in our society. And it's not just Indigenous kids, I, not, I acknowledge that, but they are predominantly the problem in, um, our, in our prison system and they're predominantly a problem disproportionately, vastly disproportionately the problem in our uh, justice system. I think I better make some statements about some subjects. So the, the big one in Western Australia, I guess, that everyone talks about, and it's a bit frustrating for me because I see that um, it's a bit of a diversion from deeper discussion. 
is uh, independent public schools. And I know that um, we're confronted in Western Australia by uh, a situation politically, for me, it's, it's uh, kind of interesting and challenging because it's undeniable that there are a lot of people who think independent public schools are a good idea, but it's just as equally uh, undeniable that uh, a lot of people are being excluded from benefits that might be accrued through independent public schools if there are benefits. Uh, I see that at the moment we've got about half the children in the education system are, are within an independent public school system and a third of the schools. But I thought when I first looked at it at the start of the year, and I haven't had my mind changed at all about that, is that um, the system cannot work in its current form. You cannot just keep rolling it out in its current form and expect that um, that that process will end up encompassing all schools. It is impossible because the independent public school model that we're operating under now requires a threshold of non-independent public schools below which you cannot drop. Because the reality is one of the key parts of independent public schools, one of the key objectives is uh, providing principals with the ability to select their staff and so people get redeployed and where they go to, they go to the schools that aren't IPS. And that fundamentally means that in the end you can't drop all the non-IPS schools down because there won't be anywhere to put those people. I don't think that's a good thing either, by the way, but um, that is the reality of the system. So when the minister has, the minister, the new minister has come in and said that he doesn't want to oversee a two-tier education system, I think it's too late. I think we have a two-tier public education system in Western Australia right now as a consequence of the way they've rolled out the independent public schools. So it's my view that what needs to be done, and were we to win on the 9th of March next year, uh, we would conduct, if it hasn't been done, and I know that there is a, an independent study planned for after the election, um, but we would conduct an, an independent study of the benefits to students to be had from IPS. And as much as I like all of you people, and I admire and, and um, respect principals, the objective must be to accrue benefits to students, not to just the principals. So um, that means that must be the, the parameters, the criteria that you set. When you're going to analyse whether IPS works or not, it must be the benefits to the students. Now, if there are benefits, then every child in the public education system deserves to have them. Because we're the public education system. It's not, you know, I really am concerned, and this isn't about IPS, but I really am concerned about the general discussion in Australia about education. Um, if my federal colleagues have fully embraced the concept that uh, the way you improve education is that you have a race to the top. You, have, you, um, you gather a lot of data and then you effectively use that data to beat people into better performance and, um, and those who perform your reward and the other people just get thrown by the wayside or you sack them. Um, and that's, that's not what they're saying, but that if you look at the um, general tenor of, of things like um, charter school system in the States or academies in the UK, the, the, uh, the philosophy behind what is effectively a commercial view of the world and applying it to education means that there will be winners. So the race to the top means there'll be winners, but there'll be a whole lot of losers too. And I don't think that's fair. In the public education system, when you have the losers, it's the kids that are the losers. And you can't have a cohort or a generation or a number of them missing out because you're engaged in this, this experiment where you say, um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll empower all the principals to do what they want or to do, pursue pathways that they want and the ones that succeed will reward and the others will eventually get rid of or move along. Um, because what actually happens, and we're seeing it happen in the States and I think it's happening in the UK too, uh, is that not only do you get that race to the top, you get a breakdown in collaboration and cooperation between schools. And the greatest strength of this system is our size and the depth of experience within it and the skill sets that reside within the community um, in front of me right now, but more widely in the uh, education system. That's our greatest strength. But if you are a competitor, if you are racing to the top, 
you're going to be less inclined to share your failures or your successes with the people that you're racing with. That's just natural human nature. It's not any great insight. It's not, um, I don't think it's, it takes any, a, a great deal of thought to reach that conclusion. I can't understand why we think that it's going to work differently for, um, for us by saying that uh, we're going to, we're going to uh, increasingly have a system that, that is more based, um, based more on the competitive world of business than it is on uh, educating people. I, th I see educators as collaborative profession and I think you'll be at your best if you collaborate. Now, in arguing for this, this pursuit of the race to the top, our Prime Minister and, and people in the leadership in this state have um, said that they aspire to be like the top nations in the world. But when you look at those top nations in the world, they don't do this. In our state, I am aware, and I'm increasingly aware as I go around meeting principals and teachers, that the expert review group process, um, albeit having been established in a way that was intended to help people, whether it's true or not, has become, it's been perceived as something that's punitive. And uh, part of that Part of that perception comes from the fact that they're publishing the outcomes of um, ERG reviews and putting them in the public domains. It's my view that there's no benefit to be had from that. I can't see why, um, if you're going to, and if there's anyone here from the ERG, I welcome comment later on or criticism, but I can't see why um, you would conduct this process and then publish it and publicise it to the world. It's not to say that people shouldn't know about it, the system should know about it, the school should know about it, and you can uh, employ it to um, hopefully uh, benefit everybody and, and engender better outcomes. But I don't see that there's a need to publish these results, the EIG um, reviews, and I would stop that from happening. Gonski review is another subject that I think I'd better uh, touch on. It's a Interesting thing because in this state um, you would have been aware that within 24 hours of it having been delivered the Premier dismissed it as nothing more than a grab by the federal government for um, state school systems and then nothing was said about Gonski for about six months. When the new um, minister took over um, he said supportive things about Gonski. Uh, we did a panel at the ABC recently where he said he was fully supportive of, of the Gonski findings completely supportive of the Gonski findings and he was just very frustrated by the federal government not having provided a model or a framework for the Gonski to be, um, to be rolled out. And uh, I certainly do support, the thing that I support um, most strongly is the uh, identification of disadvantage in the system as being a, the most serious issue. I, I think more importantly than whether or not overall our, uh, our highest level achievers are achieving at the highest level compared to the rest of the world. I believe the most important uh, outcome from Gonski was the identification of disadvantage as a serious issue in our system. There is growing residualization within our system. Uh, increasingly disadvantage is located within the public sector and increasingly within the public system it will be located within smaller number of of uh, schools and communities. That needs to be addressed. Whether it's by Gonski or any other way, it needs to be addressed. And that, I can tell you, will be a key focus of policy development that I'll be um, pursuing. Where I would be going with disadvantage, and, you know, there is, there's a link, clearly, between disadvantage and, and uh, a lot of these negative outcomes. But where I would be going is, first of all, getting ensuring that our children are in school and you don't do that by bringing up the police and asking them to go to the shopping centre and bring them back to you. That doesn't do it. Um, what we need to do is really work at compelling and a cross-government response, supporting schools. I, the education system, as I said before, is the opportunity to identify the problem, but we need to get a, uh, a, a full government response to the actual issue once you identify it and it will invariably be in the home and the community. And it will re require a whole lot of other agencies. But we need a truancy system that actually gets kids into school. We also then need to give you a lot more support, particularly the most challenged places, a lot more support with behaviour management. And I'm not talking about um, 
outside of the school. I'm talking about people, and, and it's not programs or, or money necessarily. I'm talking about people. So you get additional people to focus on that task. That's something that I think needs to be done, and I think we can do it. That is a key way, I think. If you, if you start with the most disadvantaged and you work out from there, that's a key way of tackling this challenge. Getting the kids into school, improving the behaviour so that you allow and enable teachers to do their jobs, will be a big part of tackling this problem. Because if you look at um, a lot of the behaviour problems that you encounter in high school, later, later part, stages of primary school, if you deal with literacy in the early days, and behaviour in the early days and problems at home and all those sorts of things in the early days, then you will be able to reduce the impact of um, bad behaviour later on. And you know, there's a direct link between better behaviour and, and literacy levels as well. So literacy will be a part of that as well.